Chapter Six of Mazarin by Arthur Hassel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter Six: The Close of the Fronde, sixteen fifty one to sixteen fifty three. At the time of the celebration of Louis the Fourteenth's majority, September seventh, sixteen fifty one. The king's council included Orléans, the Marquis of Chateauneuf, who always hoped to be Mazarin's successor, Molay, and La Vieuxville, superintendent of the finances. While Mazarin remained at Brûl, Condé with his brother Conti, Nemours, Rochefoucauld, and Viol was at Chantilly. Already influenced by the Duchess of Longueville, he had decided on rebellion, and the political situation of France seemed to favor his plans. Oliver Cromwell, successful in England, was disposed to foment troubles in France, if not actually to seize some of her northern ports. Spain was bidding for an English alliance. In the south, Condé was received with enthusiasm, and the families of La Force, La Rochefoucauld, La Tremoille, and Rouen embraced his cause. Donion, who held the fortress of Brouage and was governor of La Rochelle, and who hoped to form La Rochelle with Ray and Oleron into an independent principality, supported him. Condé's schemes were extensive he proposed to carry the war to the Loire, to effect a junction with the Duke of Nemours, who commanded troops in the north of France, while Turenne, supreme at Stenay, would march through Champagne and perhaps occupy Paris. The crisis was serious, for France was still split into a number of selfish, unpatriotic factions, while the almost universal hatred of Mazarin, was a serious obstacle to the development of the tendency toward the triumph of monarchy. At first, the council showed unexpected vigor. On September 26, 1651, Louis the Fourteenth and the court left Paris for Fontainebleau, and in October proceeded with a small army into the province of Berry. Success attended the efforts of the king's party. In Saintonge, where Arcourt commanded, Cognac was relieved, November, and La Rochelle was seized, while in Berry the king occupied Bourges and established the royal authority. The court then proceeded to Poitiers. By the end of the year, a considerable step had been taken toward the suppression of the rebellion. All danger from Lower Poitou had disappeared, and Donion had made terms with the court. Condé's hopes of seizing La Rochelle and Saintonge were defeated, and some of his supporters urged him to make peace. Condé, however, was more obstinate than ever in his determination to secure his own supremacy. He handed over Bourg, a town in Guienne, to Spain, and the king at once sent to Paris a declaration depriving Condé of his governments and honors. He endeavored to strengthen his position by means of new allies, and made advances to Charles IV, Duke of Lorraine. For eighteen years, a duke without a duchy, this adventurer was always ready to enter into projects of any kind. All danger from the union of Lorraine with Condé was, however, removed, by the intervention of Mazarin, who dangled before the duke the hope of the restitution of his duchy as a reward for his loyalty to Louis the Fourteenth, Foiled by Mazarin in his designs upon the Duke of Lorraine, Condé had also hoped to secure assistance from Oliver Cromwell. Agents from the prince proceeded to England and it was said that Englishmen were busy trying to persuade Bordeaux to form a republic. Condé's envoys to Cromwell were carefully watched by Mazarin's spies, and there is no doubt that Mazarin succeeded in inducing Cromwell not to support Condé. 
at the end of 1651, that prince could rely upon Spain alone for help in his rebellion against the French monarchy. On January 29th, 1652, Mazarin, at the head of an army, joined the court at Poitiers. The news of his return had caused great excitement in Paris, where the Parlement, on December 29th, put a price on his head and decreed the sale of his invaluable library. Two days after his arrival at Poitiers, Turenne and Boulon also came to give their services to the royal cause. In place of the principality of Sedan, which Richelieu had taken from their family, Mazarin had given them the duchies of Chateau-Thierry and Albret, with the counties of Evreux and Auvergne, and other domains. The value of Turenne to the king's cause was at that time immense. Troops were required for the defense of Catalonia, which had been abandoned by Marsan, one of Condé's adherents. A fleet had to be sent to Barcelona, but above all, the revolt in Anjou required immediate suppression. De Retz received his cardinal's hat. The council was rapidly reorganized. Chateauneuf, Mazarin's rival, retired, and an advance was then made into Anjou. On the Loire, the Frondeurs had two armies, one under Beaufort, the other under Nemours. At Jargo, on March 29, 1652, they were defeated by Turenne. The news of the defeat of his forces brought Condé from Bordeaux to the Loire, and on April 1st at Blénaud he defeated the royal troops. The arrival of Turenne saved the royal army from a complete disaster. Condé, writes the Duc d'Aumal, had reached his mark and had annihilated one of the royal armies when the fortunate intervention of Turenne and his cool boldness and tactical skill changed the result of the day. But if Condé had taken the offensive in his wonted fashion, he might perhaps have overwhelmed Turenne and found Louis the Fourteenth on his hands. Instead of continuing the operations on the Loire, Condé hurried off to Paris to win over the Duke of Orléans and the Parlement. The capital was indeed incensed against Mazarin, but the Parlement was not prepared to oppose the king, the declaration of whose majority had taken all power out of the hands of the Duke of Orléans. As Mazarin had hoped, a national party was slowly being formed among the bourgeoisie, who longed for peace and the establishment of order. Unable to secure support from the well-to-do classes, Condé turned to the mob and determined to stir up popular passions. This was all the easier, as Turenne was close at hand with the king and Mazarin. Had Mazarin adopted Turenne's advice and boldly entered the capital and proclaimed the king, the war would probably have been ended. But Mazarin, knowing how hated he was, decided to carry on negotiations and was supported in his decision by the queen mother. Meanwhile, Turenne, on May 4th, overthrew Condé's Spanish forces at Etampes, and the effect in Paris of the news of the defeat was considerable. Anarchy increased, and all government disappeared. The sudden arrival of the Duke of Lorraine with 10,000 mercenaries to relieve the town of Etampes, then besieged by Turenne, was a serious danger to the royal army. Turenne, however, by his skill, averted the danger, and the Duke retired to the frontier. Turenne then advanced on Paris, which, during the next few months, was the scene of disorder. Condé was encamped at Saint-Cloud, and on July 2, 1652, the Battle of Saint-Antoine was fought. Persuaded by Mazarin and the young king to attack before his preparations were complete, Turenne was at first checked by his brilliant antagonist. When his guns had come up, the final arrangements were being made for a decisive effort. 
but Mademoiselle de Montpensier, Mademoiselle, the famous daughter of the Duke of Orléans, turned the guns of the Bastille upon the royal army, while Condé's force was admitted into Paris. Scenes of violence at once took place, and on July 4th the mob, encouraged by Condé and his soldiers, set fire to the Hôtel de Ville, where the general assembly of the city was sitting, and murdered several of the councillors. This massacre of the Hôtel de Ville, though immediately followed by the establishment of Condé's rule in Paris, was the death-blow to the party of the princes. But for a time Paris was forced to submit to a government which included Orléans as lieutenant-general of France, Condé as commander-in-chief, Beaufort, governor of Paris, and Bruxelles, provost. The monarchical party, however, daily gained strength. In Paris, the reaction steadily went on, and in August the Parliament was ordered by the king to proceed to Pontoise. In order to remove all cause of irritation and to propitiate Paris, Mazarin, on August 19th, voluntarily left the kingdom a second time. Condé's last excuse for rebellion was gone. The departure of Mazarin placed the princes in a difficult position. On August 22nd, they declared to the Parlement that they were ready to lay down their arms on certain conditions. They were to be confirmed in their honors, dignities, and governments, and to be allowed to keep in their employ the troops which they had raised. At the same time, they prepared to continue the civil war, and sent a pressing appeal to the Spaniards and to the Duke of Lorraine for assistance. Mazarin, who accused the Duke of Lorraine of having broken his engagements with him, at once advised an energetic opposition on the part of the royal troops to the Lorrainers. For a time, however, it seemed that the royal cause was threatened with very real danger from its foreign enemies. Considering that the cause of Condé was not hopeless, the Archduke Leopold, governor of the Spanish Netherlands, ordered Fouen Saldagne to lead a Spanish force into France to effect a junction with the Duke of Lorraine, who was simultaneously advancing, and to march on Paris. But the Spaniards were only half-hearted, and were content to leave the parties in France to continue their intestine struggles. On Turenne's approach, Fouen Saldagne fell back to the frontier and besieged Dunkirk. Meanwhile, the Duke of Lorraine, with from 9,000 to 10,000 men, was marching on Paris. His plan was to occupy the heights of Villeneuve, Saint-Georges, unite with Condé, and overwhelm Turenne's small army. Turenne, however, anticipated the Duke, and during the month of September, in command of Villeneuve Saint-Georges, held in check the Lorrainers as well as Condé's forces. Had Turenne been boldly attacked, he would, in all probability, have been defeated by his more powerful enemies. But Condé, perhaps through illness, showed no decision, and Lorraine, a mere adventurer, had no liking for a pitched battle. The Bourbon monarchy was once more saved from imminent danger. Early in October, Lorraine's army disappeared, and that of Condé did nothing. But the results of the unpatriotic conduct of the princes were far-reaching. The country round Paris had been devastated, and the devotion of a portion of the bourgeoisie and peasants for their allies gave way to a desire for a settled government and protection from devastation and disorder. In fact, the hatred felt for the Lorrainers was such that the Duke could only at great risk visit Paris. On October 12th, he narrowly escaped being murdered by the mob. A more serious result of the continuance of the civil strife was the loss of Dunkirk. The Spaniards had wisely pushed on their operations against the town with vigor, and in August had increased the number of their troops. The French fleet had been scattered by Blake, 
the English admiral, and Dunkirk capitulated on September 16th. Having already retaken Gravelines and Mardyke, the Spaniards had every hope of continuing their successes. It is impossible, wrote Mazarin, to prevent these misfortunes if the French continue to act against France. The cause of the princes was, however, rapidly declining. Montan, their principal fortress in the centre of France, was lost to them early in September. During that month, between the rival forces of Turenne and Lorraine, negotiations were proceeding, all of which lay in the direction of the triumph of the monarchy. There was no reason for prolonging the period of unrest, and all classes in Paris agreed to urge the king to return. The Parlement, the merchants, the artisans were united on this point, and the Cardinal de Retz was found among a deputation to Saint-Germain to beg Louis to enter his capital. On October 13th, the Duke of Lorraine led his forces away, and Condé shortly afterwards retired with a small force to join the Spaniards. On October 14th, Beaufort was removed from his post of governor of Paris. The way was now prepared for the return of the court, and on October 21st, 1652, Louis entered Paris amid a scene of wild enthusiasm. An amnesty was at once passed for all the offence which had occurred since February 1651, and all reinforcements to Turenne and Bar-le-Duc, Ligny, and Commercy were easily regained by the French. Mazarin was now ready to accede to the wishes of the Queen Mother, the King and Servaillant, and to return. On January 12, 1653, chateau Porcian was retaken by the French, and at the end of the month, Mazarin left the army and proceeded to Soissons. On February 3, 1653, in company with the king, who had met him some miles outside the city, Mazarin entered Paris. The state of the finances required Mazarin's immediate attention. On January 2, 1653, La Vieuxville, the superintendent of finance, had died, and Nicolas Fouquet immediately applied for the post. Other applicants appeared, Servian, Mollet, and Le Tellier. Mazarin came to a characteristic decision. Richelieu had laid it down that it was impossible for two men, mutually jealous, to appropriate state funds. Mazarin resolved to put into force this opinion. On February 7, 1653, Servian and Fouquet were nominated jointly to the post. Till Servion's death in 1659, there were thus two superintendents of finance. In undertaking, in addition to his duties as procureur général, the responsibilities of this new office, Fouquet was embarking upon a dangerous, if lucrative, course. The finances were in a hopeless condition. The social and political upheaval caused by the Fronde had not yet subsided. The struggle with Spain still continued. All the avenues to new loans were closed. The practical bankruptcy of the government in 1648 had destroyed its credit, and no one could be found willing to lend money. Only through the personal credit of Mazarin or of Fouquet could the state induce men to lend money. Such a method of raising loans had obvious disadvantages. Public and private money became involved in extraordinary confusion, and many loopholes for adverse criticism soon appeared. Colbert, who had the management of Mazarin's private estate, and who aspired to a high position in the state, had already quarreled with Fouquet and was his declared enemy. Though he continued to warn Mazarin, the minister found that Fouquet's ability to raise money from rich capitalists was invaluable. At first, however, the system of having two superintendents did not work well, 
and it was not till after a change had been made at the end of 1654 that men lent willingly. Mazarin's success had been largely due to the military qualities of Turenne, to the support of his subordinates, to the loyal aspirations of the bourgeoisie, and to the divisions among the nobles. It was important to unite all parties around the throne and to end the war. Turenne was deservedly covered with honours, and to the house of Bouillon were given the duchies of Albret and Chateau Thierry, and the counties of Auvergne, Evreux, and Gisors. In 1660, the marshal was given the title of Grand Captain to distinguish him from the other generals. Mazarin, like Richelieu, preferred to employ men of the middle class, and though he recognized the value of such men as Nicolas and Basile Fouquet, who were respectively superintendent of the finance and head of the police, he had more confidence in the honesty of Le Tellier, Abel Servian, Hugh Lyonne, and Jean-Baptiste Colbert. To these men, Mazarin gave honors and titles freely, and not infrequently valuable emoluments. He was wise in doing so. It was by the aid of this devoted band of counsellors that he was able to establish his power, win over the nobles, keep the parlement and clergy in order, and conciliate the bourgeoisie. With the bourgeoisie of Paris, Mazarin soon cultivated excellent relations. The obligations of the government were recognized, order was as far as possible preserved in the streets, and literary men were paid to praise both king and minister. Mazarin was fully cognizant of the power of the press, and till his death numerous writers received pecuniary assistance from him. Being till 1659 involved in a war with Spain, Mazarin was unable, in accordance with Colbert's wish, to found trading companies and generally to encourage the growth of a merchant marine. With the Parlement, Mazarin's relations were on a more delicate footing, and it was more difficult to conciliate the lawyers than to win over the citizens. For many years, the Parlement had been the sworn foe of the cardinal, who had done his best to curtail its exaggerated claims and absurd pretensions. By the lavish use of bribery, however, Mazarin won over to the royal side many of the members of the Parlement, and he procured the nomination of Pompon de Believre as president in succession to Molay, who retired in March 1653. The efforts of Believre, who was supported by Nicolas Fouquet, the procureur general, had beneficial effects, and the latent opposition of the Parlement to the government did not cause Mazarin much anxiety. With the clergy and religious orders, the cardinal had little difficulty. The supporters of the government were liberally rewarded, the cardinal, Antonio Barberini, becoming Bishop of Poitiers, and in 1657, Archbishop of Reims. The religious orders, such as the Franciscans and the Jesuits, were for the most part devoted to the royal cause, and Mazarin found their support useful during his contests with his old enemy, Innocent X. The nobles, after 1652, gave Mazarin little trouble. Vanquished and guilty of treason, they hastened to make abject submission to the government. La Porte gives amusing instances to illustrate the rapidity of the conversion of the upper orders. To Le Mans, he says, disait tuto à la reine que toute la France était Mazarine. And in describing the manner in which the crowd did reverence to the cardinal, he says, J'y vis un religieux qui se prosterna devant lui avec tant d'humilité que je crus qu'il ne s'en relèverait point. Mazarin had experienced the value of the support of the fickle noblesse, and he had for a long time past determined to consolidate his power and firmly to establish his influence, 
by bringing about marriages between his nieces and members of the principal families in France. His policy was in a way somewhat similar to the family settlement policy of some of the Plantagenets. In 1651, the Duke of Mercure, the eldest son of the Duke of Vendôme, and one of the leading nobles in France, had married Laura Mancini. From the year 1650, Mazarin had wished to marry another niece to the eldest son of the Duke of Bouillon, so as to remove the irritation of the Duke and his brother Marshal Turenne, owing to the loss of Sedan by their family. On August 9, 1652, the Duke of Bouillon died, and later his son, the young Duke Godefroy Maurice de la Tour, married Maria Anna Mancini, the youngest of Mazarin's nieces. Anna Maria Martinozzi had a varied career. Mazarin had intended that she should marry the Duke of Candal, the son of the Duke of Epernon, but the Duke was unwilling to make what he regarded as a mésalliance, and Anna Maria Martinozzi, in February 1654, married the Prince of Conti. On May 1653 there arrived from Rome, in company with Mazarin's two sisters, Mesdames Mancini and Martinozzi, three more nieces, Maria Hortensia and Maria Anna, together with their brother, Philip Mancini. For these, suitable marriages were arranged. Hortensia, in 1661, married the Duke of Meilleret, the nephew of Richelieu, who became the Duke of Mazarin, and one of the heirs of the Cardinal. In 1657, Olympia Mancini married Eugène of Savoie, Count of Soissons, and became the mother of Prince Eugène, so famous in the Spanish Succession War. By these marriages, Mazarin secured a hold on several of the noble families in France. At the beginning of 1653, the only great houses which were openly hostile to him were those of Orléans, Condé, La Trémoille, and Arcourt. The Count of Arcourt, the head of the fourth branch of the House of Lorraine, had entered into treasonable relations with the Emperor and had threatened to hand over to him the important town of Breisach. But Mazarin's diplomacy came to his aid, and Arcourt was induced to submit. Orléans and his daughter were now powerless. The influence of Condé was destroyed, and La Tremoille, who was governor of Charleville, was won over by means of the Duchesse of Chevreuse. The governors of strong places in the north of France had already proved their fidelity, and the governors of the principal provinces, such as Longueville in Normandy, La Meilleraie in Brittany, Mercure in Provence, Epernon in Burgundy, L'Hôpital in Champagne, and Les Diguières in Dauphiné, were loud in protesting their loyalty. By his skill and moderation, Mazarin had thus conciliated the bourgeoisie, reduced the Parlement and clergy to obedience, and won over the French nobles. Having by this policy strengthened his position in Paris, Mazarin was able still further to use his power in the interest of the peace of the kingdom and devote his attention to crushing all the resistance in the south, east, and west of France. Having accomplished the pacification of provincial France, he was then in a position to turn with renewed vigor to the task of carrying out military operations against Spain and of bringing the war to a conclusion. On learning that Mazarin had returned to France, the partisans of the princes in Provence met and resolved to take up arms. The Parlement of Aix, however, declared them rebels, and the Count of Alais, the governor, was arrested and imprisoned. In his place, the Duke of Mercure was appointed, and in May 1652 he was formally installed as governor of Provence. For upwards of a year, Mercure steadily pursued a consistent policy. Toulon, Tarascon, Cisteron, and Saint-Tropez 
resisted the royal authority and had to be reduced by force of arms. Other difficulties were rapidly settled owing to the good relations subsisting between Mercure and the inhabitants, and by the end of 1653 Provence was pacified. In Burgundy the difficulty was less. Epernon, who had succeeded Condé as governor, submitted, and Bellegarde, which was besieged in May of 1653, yielded in June. In Guienne, the state of things was far more serious than in any other part of France, and the resistance to the royal authority was determined. In Bordeaux, princes and parlement and people were united in hatred of Mazarin. Democratic views were widely held, and confident in their own powers of resistance and buoyed up with hopes of foreign aid, the inhabitants prolonged the war till the end of July 1653. Condé, in undertaking in 1652 his famous journey to the Loire and then to Paris, had left the government of Bordeaux in the hands of his brother, Conti, who was advised by a council which included the Duchess of Longueville, Marsan, and Lenay. Disorder soon broke out in Bordeaux. The Parlement fell into two divisions, the minority, known as the Little Fronde, favoring moderate views, while the majority united with the extreme section of the people known as the Orme or Ormists. Conti had the weakness to support an attack upon the moderate party of the Parlement, civil war ensued, and Bordeaux fell into the hands of the demagogues, whose actions recall those of the Jacobins in 1793 and 1794. These internal dissensions favoured the progress of the royal arms. On the retirement of the Count of Arcourt from the command of the army, the Duke of Candal, son of Epernon, was appointed. As soon as the royal authority was established in Paris, Mazarin took energetic measures to suppress the revolt in Guienne. The growth of a royalist party in Bordeaux was encouraged, the Duke of Vendôme with a fleet appeared at the confluence of the rivers Garonne and Dordogne, and the Count of Dognon, governor of Bourrage, made terms. His defection was a fatal blow to the cause of the princes of Bordeaux. Attacked from within and without, the Orme gradually realized that no help from either Spain or England was possible. Conti negotiated secretly with Mazarin, and at length a treaty was signed on July 31, 1653. The Dukes of Vendôme and Candal entered Bordeaux, Marsan, Lenay, and other partisans of the princes were allowed to depart, and measures were taken to assure the tranquillity of Bordeaux. Only the leaders of the Orme were executed. Conti himself married one of Mazarin's gifted nieces, and the Duchess of Longueville, the evil genius of the house of Condé, made her peace with her husband, and on his death adopted a religious life in Paris. Was, however, not deceived by the appearances of loyalty in Bordeaux. He had rightly gauged the character of the inhabitants of the southwest of France, and knew that the treaty lately made had only covered up the flame and not extinguished it he ordered Vendôme and Candal to take careful precautions against future outbreaks, and when a Spanish fleet appeared in November 1653 at the mouth of the Gironde, it met with no support. Thus was concluded the long struggle of the Fronde. Over all France, the royal authority had asserted itself. Internal disorder was rapidly disappearing before the almost complete extinction of Condé's faction as a power in the state. Henceforward, the French nobles were no longer a danger to the state. They were employed in warfare or at the court, but had no opportunity of becoming great local magnates. Henceforward, the Parlement of Paris, shorn of its political functions, was forced to confine itself to its judicial duties and to bow before the strong will of Louis the Fourteenth. 
henceforward the principal government offices were filled by men who had sprung from the bourgeois class or from that of the lesser nobles men such as colbert servian lyon and le tellier mazarin had successfully carried out and completed the work of richelieu the great nobles had forfeited all claim to confidence their selfishness incapacity and want of patriotism had been fully illustrated during the period from sixteen forty eight to sixteen fifty one and mazarin was fully justified in crushing forever the last efforts to introduce feudalism into government having destroyed the two frondes and having re-established order and the authority of the king mazarin was called upon to give to the reorganized monarchy the force necessary to conquer its external foes from sixteen fifty three to sixteen fifty nine mazarin successfully accomplished that task and placed the french monarchy at the head of the nations of europe his first duty was to drive the spaniards from champagne to attack them in italy and catalonia to take from them the seaports of flanders and finally to compel them to make peace it was not until the peace of the pyrenees was signed in sixteen fifty nine that mazarin's work was accomplished throughout these years mazarin had exhibited diplomatic qualities of a high order richelieu would probably at certain epochs have acted in a more decided manner that at the end of sixteen fifty after hotel mazarin should have immediately adopted energetic measures to establish his position is incontestable he ought also after the campaign on the loire in sixteen fifty two to have taken turenne's advice and advanced boldly on paris and proclaimed louis the fourteenth king instead of such decisive action he preferred negotiations which caused the battle of st antoine and anarchy in paris for some months that mazarin's position was peculiarly difficult is evident throughout these years the spanish war proved of great assistance to cond and hampered the royal cause fortunately spain did not possess a general of special merit and as soon as turenne's period of treason ended all serious danger to france was over though the loss of dunkirk in september of sixteen fifty two was sufficient evidence of the disastrous effects of conde's rebellion in addition to the spanish alliance the influence of french women upon the course of the civil wars added to mazarin's responsibilities the duchess of longueville was answerable in great part for the rising in normandy in sixteen fifty one and for the treason of turenne she also threw all the weight of her influence on the side of rebellion when cond at the time of the king's majority was still hesitating she continued at bordeaux to support conti in sixteen fifty three in defying the royal power hardly less important was mademoiselle de montpensier who took so notable a part in the battle of st antoine the mother and wife of cond both acted energetically against mazarin and the duchesse of chevreuse was alternately his enemy and his ally the influence of women during the period of the frondes proved to be uniformly disastrous to the interests of france and vastly increased mazarin's difficulties the memoirs of madame de motteville and of de retz teem with illustrations of the truth of this statement richelieu it can hardly be doubted would have long before sixteen forty eight suppressed the parlement and exiled his foes mazarin failed to foresee the seriousness of the storm which began to gather round him from the very moment of his accession to power and when the storm broke he hesitated to take drastic measures he believed in negotiations and diplomacy and eventually his diplomacy succeeded though stern measures of repression would have brought the struggle to a speedy end 
and saved France an infinity of suffering, it is impossible not to admire the resolution and perseverance shown by Mazarin. Time was on his side, and slowly but surely events turned out as he had anticipated. The reaction in favour of the royal power steadily grew, and all the elements of disorder were one by one eliminated. He had continued the work of Richelieu, and by the end of 1653 had arrived at the goal of the ambition of his predecessor. But he preferred devious paths to Richelieu's stern and rapid methods. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of Mazarin by Arthur Hassel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Spanish War and the English Alliance, 1648 to 1659. The continuance of internal trouble in France and the death in November 1650 of William the Second, Stadtholder of the United Provinces, upset all Mazarin's schemes with regard to Spain and England. The Peace of Munster, made in January 1648 between the Dutch and the Spaniards, had confounded his policy and frustrated all his hopes. But though his plans had for the moment failed, he trusted by means of the influence of William II to induce the States-General to cancel the peace. In that event, he anticipated an early triumph over Spain and an opportunity for interfering in England on behalf of the Stuarts. It seemed that the time had come to strike a blow against Republican institutions and Republican parties, for while a Republic had been established in England, the Republican Fronde troubled France, and William II's Republican opponents received encouragement from England. The new Fronde of the princes was on the side of Spain. In England, Spain was popular, while the United Provinces had seceded from the French alliance and joined Spain. Mazarin was therefore justified in considering the advisability of uniting with William II in attacking the Roman Catholic Netherlands and in attempting the restoration of the Stuarts. The houses of Bourbon, Stuart, and Orange would thus join in opposition to the English Commonwealth, and a great blow would be inflicted on Spain. William II's death on November 6, 1650, destroyed this scheme, and like the Dutch alliance with Spain in 1648, came as an overwhelming blow to Mazarin's hopes. In December 1650, he had indeed, by the victory of Rotel, driven the Spaniards out of Champagne. But his exile from France and the general confusion which ensued rendered any effective operations against the Spaniards in 1651 impossible. Moreover, Condé, who was supreme in Paris during the greater part of 1651, entered into negotiations with Spain and was apparently prepared, in order to secure his own position, to make a definite alliance with Philip IV. After the king had attained his majority in September 1651, Conde plunged into civil war and had no hesitation in accepting the aid of the Spaniards. The Archduke Leopold, without any difficulty, retook Fuen and some other places, and in 1652 his troops won many successes. It was said by the Venetian minister that while former years had been filled with constant victories for France, now every week brought the news of some loss. No decisive battle was fought, but the Spaniards gradually recaptured most of the places which France had won, 
at the expense of many lives and much treasure in the earlier years of the war. In May 1652, they attacked and took Gravelin, which they had lost in 1644. And in August, Dunkirk was closely invested and a regular siege of the place was begun. Recognizing the advantages accruing to Spain from a continuance of the disorder in France, the Archduke had decided not to send active help to Condé and his party, trusting that they would be strong enough to hold their own and continue the civil war. He therefore ordered Fuensaldaña not to attack Paris in concert with the Duke of Lorraine in the summer of 1652, but to lead his army to Dunkirk. Though Mazarin had long been aware of the danger which threatened Dunkirk, he failed to recognize the necessity of at once gaining the support of Oliver Cromwell. As early as 1650, he had noted the importance of England and the necessity of conciliating the English government, but it was not till later that events forced him to realize the necessity of an alliance. In June 1651, one of his own secretaries had been unable to enter Dunkirk owing to the presence of some twelve or fifteen English ships which were watching the town. Though, too, he was well aware that supplies and reinforcements could only be introduced by a fleet, he failed to recognize the strength of the anti-French feeling in England and thus lost Dunkirk. The history of the loss of this important place illustrates admirably the methods of the cardinal and the strength and weakness of his character. In 1651 he seems to have hoped to secure the aid of either the Dutch or the English fleet in order to save Dunkirk. Its governor, Estrade, who in June 1651 advised Mazarin to collect all the troops then garrisoning towns in the north of France and to attack Paris, was helpless. Dunkirk was besieged by the Spaniards and apparently could not hold out beyond the end of January 1652. To save the place, secret negotiations had indeed been opened with England and Holland. With the latter power, the French negotiations were opened probably at the close of November 1651, but owing to the protests of the Spanish ambassador, and to the dislike of the states to a fresh war, they had been broken off. Meanwhile, Estrade had in all probability already offered to admit an English garrison into the town. Cromwell, with the assent of two members of the Council of State, had before this sent secretly a Colonel Fitzjames to Dunkirk, and the result of his mission was that Estrade seriously considered the possibility of delivering the town to the English government. In January 1652, Fitzjames was again sent to Dunkirk with definite overtures, which Cromwell intended to be presented to the French government. Estrade declared that the proposals of Cromwell were laid before Mazarin at Angers. At any rate, Mazarin was far from showing any anxiety to close the bargain. He was busy fighting Condé and his partisans on the Loire, and hoped that a decided success in that quarter would render the acceptance of the English terms and the surrender of Dunkirk unnecessary. In April 1652, 5,000 English soldiers were assembled at Dover, ready to be conveyed to Dunkirk but Mazarin haggled and hesitated. He hoped that he could preserve Dunkirk by means of a relieving fleet and that the English would not interfere with the French expedition. As Louis the Fourteenth's government still persisted in refusing to recognize the Commonwealth, Mazarin's hopes of English neutrality were destined to be disappointed and a severe penalty was exacted for his failure to realize the true position of affairs. Mazarin had indeed formed a plan, but none of the measures taken to relieve Dunkirk 
were of any avail. God knows, he wrote to Estrade, the trouble that I have taken during the last six months to send you help. There was only one way to relieve Dunkirk, and Mazarin only too late realized the vital importance to France of a friendly understanding with England. The Duke of Vendôme, the French admiral, was ordered to bring a fleet from La Rochelle, and taking advantage of the temporary absence of Blake and the English fleet, which was at that moment in pursuit of some Dutch ships, to throw supplies and reinforcements into Dunkirk. Vendôme, however, found the execution of his task beset with difficulties. Near the islands of Ré and Oléron, he was attacked on August 19th by some Spanish ships and by some vessels under the Count of Dognon, one of Condé's supporters. Though victorious, Vendôme had to put back into La Rochelle to refit and revictual. Delays occurred, and at last it was decided to collect ships from Picardy and Normandy, especially from Calais and Boulogne, and with them to assist the besieged garrison in Dunkirk. On September 14th, this hastily equipped fleet, which numbered seven vessels and some fire ships, set sail, and was met by some Spanish ships under the Marquis of Lead, who had surrendered Dunkirk to the French in 1646. Before a battle could take place, the English fleet of fifteen ships under Blake arrived and captured all the French vessels except one, which escaped under cover of the night. The following day, September 16th, Dunkirk surrendered to the Spaniards. Mazarin's hesitation and ignorance of the character of Cromwell and of the true position of affairs in England had brought upon France a great disaster. He had carried on his negotiations too long, fancying that by waiting he could obtain English neutrality at a much lower price. In April he seems to have almost made up his mind to hand over Dunkirk as the price of an English alliance against Spain. Had he done so, France would have gained enormously, and the Treaty of 1658 with England would have been antedated by some five years. But as yet he had not realized the tenacity of Cromwell and of his council, and he hoped to gain his ends at a cheap rate. As it was, he overshot the mark, and the Italian diplomatist only learned after bitter experience that methods suitable for dealing with continental statesmen were inadequate for treating with a man like Oliver Cromwell. He had, however, learnt his lesson, and in December 1652 the French government formally acknowledged the English Commonwealth. Never was France in greater need of a powerful ally. The year 1652, which saw the fall of Dunkirk to the great delight of Condé and his supporters, who boasted that they were now masters of the sea, saw also the loss of Casale and Catalonia. The influence of France in Italy suffered a severe blow, and the Duke of Mantua, to whom was given the custody of Casale, became the ally of Spain. In 1628, Casale had been captured by Richelieu, who also before his death had united Catalonia to the French crown. The loss of that great province was immediately due to the rebellion of Condé in 1651 and 1652. Marsan, the governor, was a supporter of the prince, and on the outbreak of the civil war had left Catalonia to aid in the revolt of Bordeaux. In 1653, it was Mazarin's duty to carry on the war with vigor against Spain and to recover what had been lost since 1648. For these extensive operations, money was required, and Mazarin continued to find Fouquet's services in this respect invaluable. In December 1654, Mazarin divided the functions of the two superintendents. To Servillon was given the Department of Expenditure, to Fouquet that of Receipts. 
In other words, to Fouquet was allotted the whole management of loans. This division of functions was not made a moment too soon. Freed from the trammels imposed on him by his colleague, Fouquet proved equal to the demands made on him for the Spanish War. Though the king had no credit, the courteous Fouquet was regarded with confidence. He was known to be wealthy, he was easy of access, his manner was conciliatory, his financial abilities were undoubted. Men at once lent willingly to Fouquet, and Fouquet lent to the king. In 1656, after the capture of Valenciennes, Fouquet provided 900,000 livres. At the end of 1657, 10 million more. Freed from immediate anxiety with regard to funds, Mazarin could devote himself to the overthrow of Spain. The recognition of the English Commonwealth, the dispersal of the discontented princes, and the suppression of the rebellion in Guienne were valuable preliminary steps toward the attainment of this object. In 1653, Turenne defeated an attempt of Condé to capture Paris, and at the end of the year, saint menu was taken. Though aided by her alliance with Condé, Spain could not resist the skill and energy of Turenne. In June 1654, Arras was captured, and in August Stenay was relieved. The success of the French was complete. Condé and his allies were driven to Brussels, and the northern frontier was secure. Meanwhile, Arcourt, who at a critical moment had thrown up his command in Guienne and had hoped to establish himself as an independent prince in Alsace and Philipsburg, was compelled, through Mazarin's astuteness, to surrender his government, and the year 1654 ended in brilliant fashion by the capture of Quesnoy, Bains, and Clermont. The tide of Spanish successes had at last been checked, and Louis the Fourteenth, who had been crowned amid circumstances of great solemnity on June 7, 1654, had been himself present with the army besieging Stenay. The relief of Arras was the turning point in the history of the war. Arras had always been regarded as one of the gems of the Spanish monarchy, and its capture by France marked the beginning of that revival of the French military power which developed with such amazing rapidity during the ensuing years of Louis the Fourteenth's reign. As if to counterbalance these successes, Certain events occurred about the same time which demonstrated the shifting character of Italian politics and the necessity for firmness in dealing with any attempt to revive the animosities of the Fronde period. In Italy, a fresh effort at intervention on the part of France ended in failure. The Duke of Guise had led an expedition to Naples which it was expected would rise on the appearance of the French fleet but the Spaniards met him with a superior armament, and Guise was compelled to return somewhat ignominiously to France. Equally annoying to Mazarin was the escape from Vincennes of the Cardinal de Retz. On the death of the Archbishop of Paris in March 1654, de Retz had succeeded to his position, but the government would not recognize the coadjutor's claim to the office. Before the end of the month, de Retz, in hopes of securing his release, resigned his archbishopric and was transferred to the castle of Nantes, where he was treated with leniency. His resignation was, however, not accepted by Pope Innocent X, who hated Mazarin, and was friendly to de Retz, on whom he had previously bestowed a cardinal's hat. On August 8th, that worthy managed to escape to Spain and at the same time sent to the government a revocation of his resignation as archbishop. In November 1654, he arrived in Rome and was welcomed by the Pope. On January 7, 1655, Innocent X died, to the great joy of the Roman populace, 
and it was at that moment that Lyon arrived at Rome with special instructions from Mazarin to secure a papal repudiation of the claims of de Retz. In spite of the efforts of the French party among the cardinals, Fabio Chigi, the Spanish candidate, was, on April 7th, elected pope as Alexander the Seventh. The new pope, who had taken part in the negotiations leading to the peace of Westphalia, had shown an almost uniform hostility to France. Alexander at first appeared willing to give fair consideration to the case of de Retz, but he deferred appointing commissioners to consider the matter, and on June 2nd he gave de Retz the pallium, thus recognizing him as Archbishop of Paris. Fortified by this support, de Retz issued orders to certain of the clergy in Paris and handed over the administration of his diocese to two ecclesiastics, one of whom, Chasperat, who was in charge of the Madeleine, by his intrigues stirred up opposition to Mazarin. He became the centre of a cabal with which the Parlement and all enemies of the minister sympathised. Mazarin spoke in severe terms of him in a letter to Lyon. There is, he said, no greater Jansenist than that self-styled Grand Vicar of de Retz. He does an extraordinary amount of harm, moves heaven and earth to organize a cabal in Paris, and carries out blindly every measure suggested to him by the adherents of de Retz. Thus, at the opening of the campaign of 1655 against Spain, Mazarin found himself hampered by de Retz's attempts to stir up sedition in Paris. It was necessary once for all to crush the intriguing archbishop, and Mazarin spared no trouble to ensure the success of Lyon's mission in Rome. The list of charges brought against de Retz was a heavy one. He had taken part in the civil war against the king. He had intrigued with the Spaniards and with Condé. He had striven to stir up the nobles of Brittany, and after his late flight to Nantes, he had sent emissaries to engage in plots in Paris. In a word, the archbishop was charged with having stirred up rebellion and sedition and with being an abandoned criminal. As he was also a Jansenist, it was hoped he would receive little consideration from the Pope. Alexander the Seventh was an enemy of the Jansenists, with whom Mazarin had as little sympathy as he had with any of the works undertaken by the poor royalists or with the doctrine inculcated in the Augustinus. The support received by de Retz from the Jansenists, however, drew the attention of the government to a struggle between the Jesuits and Jansenists, which was mainly theological. Mazarin's ministry coincided with a period of religious fervor which was indicated by the growth of monasteries, by the lives of such men as St. Vincent de Paul, and by the foundation of Port Royal. Of this foundation, the Abbé de saint cyran was, in 1634, placed in charge, and he then closely associated it with the new tenets of Jansenism. In 1640, the Augustinus, the great posthumous work of Cornelius Jansen, appeared, in which he inculcated St. Augustine's teaching on the doctrine of grace and made an attempt to reform the Church. In 1653, the influence of the Jesuits secured the condemnation by Innocent X of five propositions contained in the book. Though the Jansenists were forced to yield to the papal authority, numerous issues were raised by the Augustinus which led to long and bitter controversies. Mazarin, who was naturally inclined to toleration, had by his moderation allayed the fears of the Huguenots on Richelieu's death, with the result that they remained tranquil during the Fronde troubles. Though pressed to adopt a policy of persecution, he hoped to be equally successful in bringing to a peaceable close the agitation which had grown out of the Jansenist movement. In his policy of conciliation, he was ably seconded by Arnaud d'Andilly, one of the chiefs of the Jansenist party, 
and for a time peace was assured. But before long quarrels again burst forth, for the majority of the Jansenists had not the moderation of Arnold d'Andilly. It was only natural that the court should view with suspicion the Jansenist movement. The princes in the Fronde struggle had shown a tendency toward Jansenism, and the Jansenists had espoused the cause of de Retz. Thus the Jansenists received no support from the royal power and remained politically insignificant. But from a theological point of view they had an importance which increased as time went on and led to a long-continued struggle in the next century over the bull Unigenitus. The Jansenists aimed, it has been said, at a conservative restoration of the theology of the fourth century and resisting the papal claims and dogma of infallibility fell back on the authority of councils thus while their political tendencies were offensive to the court their theological views brought them into collision with the jesuits and the papacy the jansenists held and defended the stern views of jansen as to the efficacy of grace and the inability of man to attain to perfection, and the members of the Port Royal, whose cloister life was remarkable for purity and simplicity, were devotedly attached to Jansenist doctrines. In an evil moment for themselves, the Jesuits attacked the inmates of Port Royal, and in their defense, Pascal, in 1656, published his famous provincial letters. Though unable to make any adequate reply to Pascal's accusations, the Jesuits were sufficiently influential to secure their condemnation at Rome, and in 1660 the provincial letters were publicly burnt in Paris. In 1660 and 61, many schools which were controlled by Port Royal were closed, and throughout Louis the Fourteenth's reign, Jansenism was barely tolerated. At the close of his life, Louis fell under the influence of the Jesuits, and Port Royal was destroyed and its inmates banished. Mazarin's ministry thus saw the beginning of controversies which continued till the revolution of 1789, but it must be remembered that Mazarin refused to destroy Port Royal and carry out a policy of extermination of the Jansenists, as was suggested to him. So strong, however, was the feeling on the part of the leading churchmen in favor of orthodoxy that Mazarin showed no little wisdom in making the charge of Jansenism one of the principal points in his accusations against de Retz. Father Dunot, a Jesuit who was one of Mazarin's principal agents in Rome, had represented to Alexander the Seventh the danger of allowing de Retz, who favored the Jansenists, to remain at the head of the Paris diocese. In July 1655, the papal confessor, Father Sforza Pallavicino, spoke freely to the Pope of the alliance between de Retz and the Jansenists. As not only de Retz, but also many of his friends were Jansenists, Mazarin had good reason for expecting that the Pope would at once refuse to agree to the petition of the intriguing archbishop. But Alexander believed that de Retz had merely adopted Jansenism for political purposes and declared that though de Retz might have taken money from the Jansenists, he had preached against the doctrines of Jansen. Lyon had already been sent as a special envoy to Rome, and he demanded that proceedings should be taken against de Retz. After innumerable delays, Alexander appointed a commission to hear the charges against the Archbishop of Paris. But the conditions attached to the papal brief made it impossible for Mazarin to accept it. The Pope insisted that the Parlement of Paris and the Assembly of the Clergy should sanction the proposed agreements, which included the appointment of a suffragan in place of de Retz, and Mazarin at once refused to allow any organization in France to interfere with the supreme power of the king. 
the absolute and despotic power in france he said resided in the person of the king alone and no organization in the kingdom could share it in writing to the queen he declared that to negotiate with the parliament or the assembly of the clergy would be derogatory to the power of the king and would reduce louis to the position of a doge of the republic of france lyon was recalled in sixteen fifty six and the proceedings against de retz were dropped alexander however did little to aid the archbishop who eventually resigned his post while the suffragan regarded himself as holding his office from louis the fourteenth de retz received several abbeys and in sixteen sixty five visited paris where he was coldly received by louis the fourteenth he was nevertheless employed on missions to rome and during his later years wrote his famous memoirs equally drastic was mazarin's treatment of the parlement of paris and equally emphatic was his assertion of the royal authority early in sixteen fifty five a lit de justice had registered an edict imposing taxes which were required for the war hearing that the parlement on april thirteenth was prepared to criticize the edict louis the fourteenth who was then hunting at vincennes hurried back to the palais de justice and forbade the continuance of the discussion he and mazarin were resolved that there should be no renewal of the fronde and any attempt of the parlement to adopt an independent tone was at once checked the campaign of sixteen fifty five was successful the important town of landrecis was taken and turenne advancing between the scheldt and the sambre compelled the capitulation of the towns of conde and saint guien louis the fourteenth himself witnessed the success of his general and with him almost reached the famous stronghold of mons in other ways the year sixteen fifty five proved fortunate the spaniards had arrested and imprisoned the adventurous duke of lorraine at the beginning of sixteen fifty four at the close of sixteen fifty five the lorraine army declared for france in catalonia and italy no events of importance took place but the events of the year had clearly demonstrated the increasing power of france in sixteen fifty three mazarin had brought to an end the provincial fronde in sixteen fifty four the spaniards had been driven from champagne and the duke of lorraine had been won over by skilful diplomacy in sixteen fifty five turenne had penetrated into hainaut it was now necessary to retake the maritime towns of gravelines mardyke and dunkirk the death of william the second prince of orange in november sixteen fifty had destroyed all chance of securing a dutch alliance and the cooperation of the dutch fleet and mazarin had as we have seen turned his attention to england the action taken by blake at the time of the spanish conquest of dunkirk had been followed by antony of bordeaux being in december sixteen fifty two formally accredited as the french envoy to the english government but the relations between france and england remained unsettled english merchantmen suffered from pirates fitted out in french seaports and reprisals were frequent the protection too given by france to charles stuart was a constant source of irritation to the english people who were very suspicious of a government at the head of which was a cardinal in the english council there was a strong party which desired war with france and which found a lever to work upon in cromwell's protestant sympathies and belief that the french protestants were continually persecuted cromwell was resolved to help the french protestants should they require assistance the residents of the exiled stuarts in france constituted in his opinion a danger to the protectorate and it was suspected that when once mazarin had conquered spain he would aid in the restoration of charles stuart and so bring england into subservience to france in january sixteen fifty four 
Mazarin sent a special agent, the Baron de Basse, to assure Cromwell that if England and France concluded an alliance, Charles Stuart should no longer be allowed to remain in France. The situation was for some time critical, and rarely had Mazarin's imperturbable temper, perseverance, and diplomatic skill been so tested. Lambert and the officers clamoured for a French war, and the Archduke Leopold authorised Cardinas, the Spanish envoy, to offer the English government one hundred and twenty thousand pounds a year. Mazarin, who had already authorised Bordeaux to recognise the protectorate, instructed Basse to offer the same amount and to point out that Spain was unable to pay the proffered sum. The Dutch war being concluded, an alliance with Spain was looked for in England. Cardinas had now offered three hundred thousand pounds a year, and Cromwell had accepted the offer, though he agreed to accept a hundred thousand pounds for the time being the rest to be paid later. But the government of the Low Countries was unable to raise that money, and the relations between England and Spain quickly became strained. England was bent on an attack on the West Indies, and the relief of Arras by Turenne in August 1654 demonstrated to Cromwell that Spain was on the losing side. Mazarin at the same time convinced him that the danger to the Protestants was imaginary, and Cromwell at once began to regard the expedition to the Spanish West Indies as an attack on the Pope and the Inquisition. Before, however, an alliance between France and England was made, the massacre of the Vaudois in January 1655 took place. Amid circumstances of intense cruelty, the Duke of Savoy expelled the Protestant Vaudois from their valleys. Cromwell's vigorous remonstrances and his intimation that no treaty with France would be signed till restitution had been made to the Vaudois quickened Mazarin's action. The Duke of Savoy was ordered to restore the privileges of the Vaudois and to cause all persecution to cease. In August 1655, Mazarin's tolerant policy was accepted and acted upon by the Duke of Savoy, while England's position in Europe had been strengthened by Cromwell's successful intervention. On November 3rd, 1655, the Treaty of Westminster between France and England was signed, and Spain's remaining chance of success in her struggle with Louis the Fourteenth disappeared. By this treaty, the commercial relations between France and England were regulated. Charles Stuart and his brother were to leave France, all acts of piracy were to cease, and various restrictions of trade were removed. England at once declared war upon Spain, and it was obvious that Philip IV could not hope to contend successfully against France, England, and Portugal. Mazarin had won a remarkable diplomatic triumph. His policy was similar to that employed at other periods of his career. He decided on the goal which was to be reached, on the object to be attained. But though his aims were statesmanlike, and in full agreement with what Richelieu would have advocated, Mazarin's methods were peculiar to himself. Always ready to negotiate, and resolved to take no offence, he was not infrequently placed in an undignified position. In the pursuit of what he desired, Mazarin too often cast aside dignity, humbled himself before his adversaries, though in the end he carried his point. The difficulties in his negotiations with Cromwell were immense, and the obstacles to an alliance innumerable. Mazarin, however, steadily pursued his object. England did not make a Spanish alliance, and France, though temporarily losing Dunkirk, concluded the triumphant Peace of the Pyrenees. After the Treaty of Westminster had been signed, Lyon was sent secretly to Spain to begin negotiations for peace. 
but all chances of an immediate settlement were destroyed by the unexpected successes won by Condé in the campaign of 1656. Turenne had besieged Valenciennes, which on July 15th was relieved by Condé. A division of the French army under the incapable La Ferte saint being almost annihilated, the town of Condé was taken from the French, who were in danger of losing the advantages of the late campaigns. Vigorous measures were required at home to lessen the existing misery, abroad to bring the war to a conclusion. In January 1656, the Parlement of Paris had protested against the depreciation of the coinage and had been supported by the Parlement of Toulouse and Grenoble. The Parlement continued its remonstrances, and several of its members were banished. Eventually a compromise was arranged and peace was restored, but the action of the Parlement was only symptomatic of the general feeling of unrest in the country, where peasant risings were becoming frequent. The disaster at Valenciennes and the unrest in France combined to render Mazarin anxious to unite more closely with England, and Cromwell, aware that Spain was about to assist Charles Stuart, was equally ready to draw nearer France. On March 28, 1657, an offensive and defensive treaty was signed at Paris. The object of this Treaty of Paris was to force Spain to make peace. The two powers were to undertake the sieges of Gravelines and Dunkirk by sea and by land. At the same time, Cromwell engaged to tolerate Roman Catholicism in all places in Flanders which were handed over to England, and undertook to keep possession of Dunkirk only. Such were the principal terms of this famous treaty, which was fraught with far-reaching results for Europe, and which had such immediate and important effects upon the course of the war between France and Spain. The English alliance was one of the master strokes of Mazarin's policy, and its wisdom was fully justified. End of chapter 7